really want people to understand from the webinar. This is no kind of promotion. I do not want a promotion. I don't need one. I want to make whoever is going to join like a PG, first year PG or second year PG, to do what we can teach them. So this is the idea of a webinar. First of all, I really, uh, my heart goes out to the uh, people who are working, uh, the doctors who are working against the uh, COVID virus. And it's, uh, though it's a sad moment for the whole world, the whole world is suffering from Corona, but it's uh, sort of in one way good for the doctors because we are able to meet on almost daily basis. In fact, uh, there's a very uh, famous statement in WhatsApp now that uh, Corona is pandemic and uh, doctors' webinars are endemic. So that's what uh, is actually the famous saying. So today, what are we going to do? Uh, yesterday, we had some good training models. And I, all, I, I told you, there is no point in listening to webinars. There is no point in going on seeing people operate because that is actually not making your hands work. And if your hands are stiff for one month or two months, then when you go back to the OR, you're going to find it very difficult because your hands are already rigid. So it's going to be very difficult for you to play with your hands. So I always uh, say that the best way to learn is to swim, that is to practice. So how do you practice sitting at home? You don't have any equipment, you don't have anything. How do you practice? That is why yesterday we actually gave you the egg model. And I'm sure that one or two at least would have done uh, drilling on the eggshell and removing the membrane and suturing the membrane like what we did yesterday. So uh, I will tell you something. I've started also cooking and I'm uh, in the kitchen. Uh, I, I also cut vegetables and do all that. You know, and from there, I got a little idea. Why not we do this? So this is how, you know, ideas are created. So this is one example. I'm not saying that I'm a sort of a genius to get an idea from a kitchen. But what I mean to say is that ideas are generated. Please understand the very important statement which I want to make. So ideas come from a different field to your field. This is something which you have to impregnate in your mind. If you keep on searching ENT, you will not come uh, get something new in ENT. So uh, if you search in uh, the, the best, uh, in fact, I, I've heard several people saying, I want to study physics. So you, if you do physics, from there, you will get a lot of invention into medicine. I think that will be the best area where you can actually computers or physics or engineering. From there, you get a lot of ideas into medicine. Or if you go to another field, like for example, cardiothoracic, neurosurgery, or orthopedics or something like that. You see the deep rider uh, was given by the orthopedician. So you see like, like you have a crossover between different fields. So the instrument which the cardiothoracic people use, you may find it useful in EMT. So this is how actually new inventions come into our field of EMT. So please understand. So I'm trying not to invent or something, but to make you work during this lockdown period. So let me start by saying this topic is going to be on deep riders. So uh, even though the topic uh, given to you is um, antraconal polyp and ethmodal polyp, of course, we're going to show you a lot of videos on how to operate. We're going to make it very interactive. But today, what I'm going to show you is most of us, at least uh, maybe 60% of this audience are using deep riders. But there are 40% in this audience who have not even used a deep rider, who has not held a deep rider in his hand. So I'm going to uh, deal with some basics about the deep rider and then I will show you some models on which if you have a deep rider at home or if you have some instruments at home, you can work on some models. So I have brought a, a different model today. You can see that it's going to be something like the egg model yesterday, the egg, egg technique, the same way we're going to have some techniques. So I want to show you that, uh, you know, this is the deep rider handpiece. Of course, now uh, this is the Medtronic, of course, I'm not trying to give publicity to any company, please don't mistake me. But I use the Medtronic. This is the M4 handpiece. I'm not using the M5. The best will be the M5 handpiece. So here you have um, uh, the, the deep rider. I, uh, I will show you later how it works. Of course, this is the uh, uh, the zero blade, the rad zero blade. And you see when I, when I move, it moves in an alternate mode. You can see here, it moves like tuck, 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 like that alternate mode it moves. And uh, of course, 
the blades which you should have when you do polyp surgery if you want to order for uh, blades what are the blades which you will have so you should have the zero blade this is zero i generally have two zero blades on my table so uh, that is very important because one zero blade is always a problem it gets stuck this blade uh, i don't see in many of the uh, tables this is called the rat 12 blade that blade 12 blade is very useful for the lower part of the uncinate process so this is the rat 12 blade so always order for the rat 12 blade this is very important the rat 12 and of course when you go into the maxillary sinus you have two kinds of blade the rat 40 blade this is the rat 40 120 uh, come this is the uh, rat 40 blade of course you have to have this when you're doing the uh, maxillary sinus of course when you're doing the uh, frontal sinus you have an angulation which is greater than this at the rat 60 blade and of course you have the 120 blade as well that is used for uh, i don't use that much because uh, i feel the malleable hue visor is better than the rat uh, 120 blade so i'm just going to show you how to actually uh, practice with a deep rider at home if you if you in case have a deep rider or if you don't have a deep rider also i'm going to give you a model on which you can practice endoscopic sinus surgery you don't need to have a camera you don't need you just need an endoscope with a light source worse comes you don't need anything just just practice with this model so i'm going to introduce to you this model is very 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 cheap and, uh, and not at all expensive available throughout the world and i'm going to show you this model which i uh, found out only maybe around a week back or so i i just i was uh, in the kitchen and i found this model okay let us let us see what i'm going to uh, tell you today like yesterday's egg model so i'm going to have my camera i hold my camera like this uh, like a flute and i'm now going to show you uh, uh, something very unique and very different yeah. so many actually uh, wonder how to use my arm is that on okay right how to use the endoscopes so uh, as i told you the the endoscope is held like a flute like this you are able to see from that camera and you see how i'm going to show you that model this is the model i'm going to talk about that's actually the capsicum model so yesterday i showed you the egg model and today i'm going to show you the capsicum model see here you are able to see polyps you see i just cut the capsicum and what you are seeing here see it's almost like the nasal cavity how many of you have seen a capsicum like this with an endoscope you see that that looks like the maxillary crest here that's the maxillary crest this is the septum here this is the septum and you see if it's bilateral nasal polyposis it resembles a bilateral nasal polyposis of course that's the level of the maxilla this is the level of the maxilla that's the coenera here and you can see here that will be the nasal pharynx and you can see if you go up that could be the sinus here you can see something like the the palate here and you can see it's a beautiful model and that goes into the uh, oropharynx you see how beautiful this model looks it looks just like polyps you see here how nicely you can see can you all appreciate the polyps inside dr uh, sri harsha please uh, please unmute sri harsha because i need me yeah. always to give a feedback now yeah. this should be the level of the frontal sinus i'm going to perform a face in this look at this it looks exactly like the nasal cavity exactly so what you can do is just take a, a capsicum like this make a window and you're already done you don't have to so for example if you're not going to use the deep rider i'm going to use a through biting give me the through biting forceps you see here uh, and you can actually perform fess and uh, you can see polyp surgery can be done here you can see here that i can just catch hold of this gently and slowly you know deep ride it or pull it of course the the topic of today is not to use the cold instruments but actually to use a a, a deep ride you see how nicely you can actually punch this and you can take that polyp one by one so this is what is called the capsicum model and i'm now going to show you how to use the deep ride you see here how i use the deep ride it's very important that you see the distance between the tip of the endoscope and the tip of the deep ride this is very important many people what they do keep the endoscope like this and move the deep rider like this this is wrong so the first to go in is should be the deep rider the first should to go in should be the deep rider and then follows the endoscope you see here 1 2 3 4 and then you see here that's the polyp and you see here so without touching the uh, edges you can actually do a polypectomy 
question. Okay, now uh, you can see here when I when I want to use my suppose I'm going up. Now I'm going to use my uh, thirty degree telescope. I just want to use my thirty degree telescope and to show you the level of the uh, skull base. This is the skull base. Uh, uh, Forty. So the, this is actually the level of the skull base here. These are the polyps which are sitting right at the level of the skull base. Now what I'm going to do is I'm, I'm, I'm using a 30 degree telescope here. That's a 30 degree telescope. And you can see what I'm trying to do is I'm going to use my 40 debrider blade. You see how I'm going to use that. This is very important. But, uh, see many people have a problem in using angle debrider blades. So I'm just going to use a 30 degree telescope and a 40 uh, degree debrider blade. You can see here that I will just use that. See, whenever I use a blade, go below, below the, come on, uh, reverse the, it looks like that, you know what Another one more. Yeah, 60. So just a minute, I will um, just show you, that's the 30 degree view. And you can see that this is a model. And see how nicely it actually mimics a polyp. Very clearly seen, the frontal recess. And of course, I will be uh, showing you how I'm going to, Debrand all these polyps without touching the edges. So then the most important thing you will get from here is actually the feel of how to use a debrider. People who want to start practicing with a debrider, try to do this before. See that. So I did it in a couple of so I'm gonna suck, I'm gonna suck in water now. And again I go inside, you see that? So I'm, I'm not sure if you have uh, noticed this idea. How many of you have seen this before or somebody has done this before? I really don't know. But what you can really do is actually get those polyps all out like this. See, I'm clearing all those polyps. I hope you guys like this idea because this is an idea which I have not at least seen anybody demonstrating this. Tomorrow I'm going to have a different model, very different new model. You see that? Now I've cleared the front. Now the idea is, you see here, my endoscope, when I go, my endoscope is below. This is what I want to tell you. My dear guys, see here, I'm going to show you with a 70 degree telescope. My 70 degree telescope, I, uh, Sri Asha, can you see in the zoom? Can you see through the zoom my camera here? Uh, one minute. See with the zoom the camera also. That's very important because you're going to see with the zoom the camera also. Okay? Give me this. Uh, uh, so. Can you see that now? Can you see that? Can you see both? The zoom and the uh, yeah. 70 degree telescope here? Yeah? You can see both. You can see both, right? The idea is your 70 degree telescope is above. You see here, the endoscope is above and the deep rider is below. See here, I introduce it like this. Never introduce it like this. I've seen people doing this kind of stuff. That is a deep rider blade above the endoscope. Okay, Asha? Yes, sir. So never do that. So introduce your endoscope like this, see here, and then go below. And you see how I'm moving my elbow. You have to move your elbow. When you're, when you're doing the um, 70 degree endoscope, you have to push the endoscope towards the ala, this is the ala, and I'm moving my elbow here, making that uh, deep rider straight, and then you see how I'm bringing the deep rider. Now you see, I'm bringing it above. Can you see the endoscopic camera now? Can you appreciate it, please? Arsha? Yes, sir, we can appreciate, sir. Yeah, can you see the polyps coming out now? This is exactly how the frontal recess has to be done. Because many people have a confusion. Sir, I'm not able to reach the polyp. And this is such a nice training model, the capsicum model. See all those polyps, very nicely being taken out. You just have to debride that here. And you see the movement, your movement should be very smooth. See, there should not be any constipation in the movement. And you can actually go right inside the skull base. And you see, use the 70 degree telescope. And you can actually clear the polyps from the crevice. You see here, that, that's, that's actually the... Uh, uh, um, maybe the roof of the sphenoid sinus, I've gone right posterior and you see how I'm clearing that 
posterior uh, part of the sphenoid sinus with my debrider. See, so you try to use this model, all of you who actually are professors who want to uh, give your cases to uh, the youngsters, actually you can give this model and make, you know, train them with this. Now, uh, imagine I want to enter into the skull base, then see here. I can actually, that, that's a fibrous dysplasia or something like that. See how exactly it mimics the... Can you all appreciate Dr. Sri Harsha? Yes sir, we can appreciate sir. It is almost like a real face, right? Yes sir. I'm telling you, I'm getting the feel of tissue here. Now I know that I'm almost close to the uh, dura here. I'm very close to the dura. And in fact, if I want to enter into the brain, I can penetrate into the brain. See here, now I'm born into the brain. And that's, that's the brain entry here. So that I can have a CSF leak here. So if you see here, the, the idea was to convey that I've completely cleared the skull base and that's actually the cripiform area and that's a septum here and I can go on to the opposite side now. So, so this model is actually, uh, yeah, straight put it. So this model is so cheap, it's so easy to follow and I just want all the juniors when they start doing fest, when they start after the lockdown and if you're actually not having anything to do, uh, I mean any case to do, then you can practice on this model. I can also show you another cheap model, just hold this. Uh, imagine, uh, straight. Imagine that there is another uh, very cheap model I want to tell you. These are all uh, things you can utilize. You just have to think and you can, tomorrow I'm going to show you something beautiful on a microscope, how to get trained with a microscope. So that is also a model. You see here, now this is another very, very cheap model. You see, this is rhinosporidosis, something like rhinosporidosis. Can you see the rhinosporidosis? The nothing but a tomato. Can you see here? It, hello, uh, see Harsha. Yes, sir, we can see. Sir. Can you see here? Yes. See how beautiful it is in the same field of a tissue. So you see the movement. I don't want to, you know, make that movement look shabby. I'm trying to actually gently move my deep right up. Maybe this is a partition between the uh, Believe me, when you do the tomato, it's almost similar to doing the uh, nose, nasal cavity. So the tomato model and the capsicum model, don't forget this. I tell you, this will give you tremendous dexterity. Tremendous dexterity. See how I'm doing that. I I'm seeing the camera. I'm not seeing inside the tomato. And actually, you see here, suppose I, I want to make this more smoother. This is a picture. Imagine, then what I will do is I will change it to the forward mode. Change it to forward mode. So then there are two modes. If you have picures in the F point, what I usually do is. I change it to the uh, forward mode, Mama. Now you see here, what I'm trying to do now is this is the alternating mode. And if I want to smoothen it, what you have to do is to change it to the forward mode. See here. So I'm going to show you the modes here available. This is just for the sake of the postgraduate. See what the modes are. You can see here that is actually the alternating mode. Uh, see that, that's 12,000. It's the M4, of course, in an M5, you have a 30,000, uh, this one, RPM. So this is actually used by many people for drop three. Of course, I don't use it for drop three. I use my uh, neuro drill system. Of course, now I've changed to the uh, uh, continuous mode. You see how it works? Uh, hold the tomato. So believe me, try to do this model. I'm telling you, without a uh, tremor, you should try to do that without tremors. This is very, very important. See that? Your, your debrider should be rock steady. So I see it's like a drill now. So if you want to smoothen the uh, cavity of the oil, 
You can ask your resident to do this. So these are all the bony tissues along the. Uh, so I am sure that many many countries they are seeing this. Uh, there are people from Uzbekistan, from Russia. So you all use the blade only once, right? You are using the blade only once. But these blades don't throw the blade. Ask your residents to actually use for all these purposes. See how you can actually innovate such ideas. This is what I want to tell you. So uh, this is the first part of my lecture. So that's it. So I am through with my model training. So you see how much of innovation you can actually do. Uh, uh, I don't say that it's a great thing, but then uh, I, I have not seen anybody uh, showing this. So that's it. So uh, are you back to the Zoom, Dr. Harsha? Let's have questions. Yes, sir. We are back. Okay. Let's let's have the questions. Uh, um, I think there are people seeing. So if you have deep rider blades, uh, which are disposable, you're going to throw it out. So don't throw it out if you are uh, using it just once. Use it on models like this. Well, uh, best would be a capsicum model which will just show you polyps. And if you want a real feel of human tissue, the tomato is the best. Of course, these are the two which I have told you today. Yesterday I told you about the egg model where you know how to drill. Of course, there are three. Tomorrow I'm going to give you some more ideas. These are all ideas which you just get like a crazy guy you can actually uh, follow. So, uh, any questions? Anyone? Anybody want, Dr. Uh, uh, Harsha? Anybody has uh, raised any questions? Anybody? Uh, there was one question uh, where they were asking you to demonstrate how do you hold the endoscope? Okay, how I hold the endoscope? I hold the endoscope like a flute. You see here, this is the camera. I think yesterday we had the same question, Harsha. Yes, sir. Okay, that's, that's the way I hold my endoscope. You can see that I'm holding it like a fruit here. This is the way I hold an endoscope. Don't hold it rigid. So there are some people who hold it sort of rigid like this. Don't do that. Because then your, your flexibility of your movements will go off. So you should be able to move your endoscope easily. So that's why I hold it like this. And this, this finger can be either above or below the endoscope. So that's, that's the best way. So, okay. So we are done. And... Um, any questions? Dr. Prakash Mumpa is there? Any comments? Sir, we have some questions. Some people have raised their hands. Uh, yeah, okay. Let's have questions and then we'll go to the lecture now. Uh, Deba Jyoti Das, can you uh, please talk, sir? Yeah, sure. Hello? Maybe it's not. Uh, we have one more uh, question from Arshad Aziz. Okay, Dr. Arshad, please. So, uh, there are some questions like which blade you will use for the adenoids. Usually, I use a RAT60 blade. For the adenoid, I, use, I don't use the adenoid blade. Because the adenoid blade is towards the uh, uh, you know fascia and sometimes it can damage the muscle. So, I keep the guard towards a, a place where I should protect. So that, that's how I use a RAT60, a normal RAT60 blade. So I don't use the reverse like the adenoid blade. I, I don't use that at all. I use it like the RAT60 only I use for the adenoid. Okay, so I think we'll go for the lecture. Shall we? Now, how do I uh, screen share? This is a screen share. Ma, in the morning, Next up. Share. Okay, so let's go for the uh, lecture here. Can you see my screen, Neha? Yes, sir. Mountain. Okay, right. Dr. Chanda, yes, so sir. people have joined. Have the people joined or not? Oh, yes, sir. 900 already. Oh, good. So I think many of them would have seen the model. Okay, let's, let's, uh, so this is the slide I wanted to show from the kitchen to the OR. You have so many new innovations you can have. Uh, by just small models like the capsicum model, the tomato model, of course. And uh, I hail from the college, the Madras Medical College. I'm really uh, thankful to my professor, Professor Gananathan, sir, for having taught me whatever I am today because of him. And of course, my teachers like Professor Dharamveer S. Sethi, he, he is very important for me uh, because he taught me the art of endoscopic sinus surgery. Okay, I'm instantly the visiting professor of neurosurgery in Vietnam Hospital, Vietnam, and also in Dabao. 
and uh, I also head the I'm the academic head of Carl Stores uh, Neurosurgery Division. Let's let's go on to uh, surgeries. Uh, let us go on directly to some very basic surgeries. So uh, let us go on to this uh, surgery now. Okay, now I'm going to show you a lot of surgeries. It's all going to be a lot of small surgeries. This was done by me a long, long time back, maybe around uh, uh, around 12 years back. So uh, you can see that I did a middle ter anterior middle terminoplasty. Again, this technique I learned from Professor Seti. And you can see that I'm now uh, dealing with the upper part of the unsenate process. I have a reason for showing this because I always say, that don't damage the upper attachment of the unsinate process. Don't damage the upper attachment of the unsinate process. You see here, uh, if I if I can, my my, I'm not able to see. See here, that's the unsinate process. How do I stop the video? Oh, it's like this. You can go up to full screen, sir. Oh, how do I do that? Cap me, yeah. Okay, now let let's see. Wait, now I'm going to show you here that I just deprived the upper part of the uh, unsinate process. You see here, this is the unsinate process here. Can you all appreciate the unsinate process? Always when you're doing FES, this is something which I always, always insist. Try to notice the upper attachment of the unsinate process. So the upper attachment of the unsinate process will definitely guide you on to telling you where the frontal drainage pathway is. For example, here, the unsinate is going towards the middle turbinate. It's not going towards the lamina papyracea. So this naturally becomes a lateral drainage or a direct drainage. You see here, this is actually called the direct drainage or the lateral drainage. You see here, I'm now trying to debride. You see how the debrider moves. It moves like a sort of a gentle uh, paintbrush kind of movement. And then you see, it's a, see that's the a, that's a unsinate process here. here. Oh. That's the unsinate process here. So here is the unsinate process and here you see here. Now this is the unsinate process here which is going towards the skull base or the middle turbinate and you see the frontal drainage pathway already here. That's a lateral drainage. So this is very very important when you do the frontal. I think the most important thing to see is whether it's a lateral drainage or a medial drainage. So if you in this case Try to put your ball probe between the unsinate process and the middle turbinate. You will land up inside the cribriform plate. So this is very, very important. So always try to see that. Now you can see that's the frontal. We are very clearly seen and that's the unsinate process which is here. So very, very clear that this is a lateral drainage. So I always say look at the unsinate process, where the unsinate process gets attached. And if it's going to get attached laterally like this, then you... I mean, sorry, immediately towards the middle turbinate, then this becomes a lateral drainage, a direct drainage into the infant So this is, uh, this is a small piece of information for you, for those who want to do frontal sinus surgery. Now I'll give you another, another uh, scenario where the same thing is uh, translated like this. Of course, this is a concha bullosa. I'm just going to excise the concha bullosa. Of course, I'm not going to show you that. This is the upper part of the unsinate process. Let us, let us see this, just the unsinate process alone. And okay, that's a maxillary sinus. Let us now go on, and that's the um, the natural ostium. Now, what I'm trying to do is to take off the uh, unsinate. You see here, this is actually the unsinate process. As I told you yesterday, to me, there doesn't exist an agonazi. So, uh, in most of the cases, uh, or even though Professor C C here, that is a paper from US. I refer to that paper that there is a ostium of the agonazi posteriorly. I do not agree with that. Uh, the agonazi is actually an illusion. There is nothing called the agonazi. This is my kind contention. You are making a paper out of it. I will, I will uh, definitely see. This is not the uh, ostium of the agonazi. This is just the agonazi cell, which uh, uh, the half egg, which Professor Stamberger has called. It appears like the half egg because the inferiorly. See the, now you can see the uh, front signs. I have pushed. The resistance terminalis, I will no, no longer call it the agarase. I push the resistance terminalis um, anterior laterally and you get the uh, the frontal drainage pathway. In this, you have a medial frontal drainage pathway. You see here, that's that's a medial frontal drainage pathway. You push the, uh, let us call it agonazi because it's already been termed agar, but to me it's not the agar. I just pushed it out 
and you find a medial drainage of the frontal sinus. So there is a distinct def, the, uh, difference between medial drainage, which appears medial to the um, the agonasi, and lateral, which appears lateral to the uh, a sort of you know uh, the upper attachment of the ancillary process. Now what I'm going to do is to show you a lot of videos, so many videos which I have collected. Now let us see them one by one, and we will have. We will have uh, discussions about it at the end of each video. Okay, that's what we are planning to do. Now, many patients come to you with turbinate hypertrophy. Okay, they have massive turbinates. Of course, I'm not talking about people who have allergy. So, people who have allergy, please do not touch them. Don't uh, you have to treat them with uh, symptomatically? Uh, uh, but uh, how do you differentiate? You have mulberry-like turbinates. You have bluish uh, sort of you know that kind of turbinates. You you have a reddish normal turbinate, uh, hypertrophy turbinate, then what I would like to do is this. So I would definitely do something to the turbinate. Of course, if I touch the turbinate, then uh, Professor Stamberger calls me the turbinator. But I, uh, I always follow Professor P.J. Ormond's technique. You see here how the turbinectomy produces, uh, uh, don't do a complete resection of the turbinate. Many people, what they do is they resect the turbinate, they, they completely cut off the turbinate, don't do that. What you have to do for the turbinate is this. This is the best way to clear the airway for people who have an enlarged turbinate. So how do you deal with an enlarged turbinate? So this is a very common um, scenario you will face in your, uh, in your practice. So I'm going to show you the 50% reduction of the uh, turbinate. Can you, can you see the picture, the huge uh, turbinate here? And you can see that. So what I will do now is... I will first make a V-shaped incision. So what I'm trying to do is you make a V-shaped incision. One incision like this and one incision like this. You make a V-shaped incision in the anterior aspect of the inferior turbinate. So this is the... So please understand, many, many have a concept, the wrong concept, that the posterior end of the turbinate is actually causing the obstruction. This is something which many, many uh, surgeons have, uh, have the misconception. But please understand, that the site of maximum resistance of the airway is the inner nasal valve. The inner nasal valve is formed by the anterior head of the uh, inferior turbinate, along with, of course, the uh, um, the cartilage there, the ala cartilage. Of course, you some people say you have to put in a spreader graft here, but we have not done spreader gaps uh, uh, for cases like this. But we have got very good results with uh, the reduction of the turbinate. You see how I'm trying to make a V-shaped incision. See that I'm making a V-shaped incision. And then what I do after making that V-shaped incision is that I debride the anterior head of the inferior turbinate. So this is the first thing I do. I debride the anterior head of the middle turbinate, uh, sorry, of the inferior turbinate. So the inferior turbinate has got two attachments. One is a vertical attachment. Second is a horizontal attachment. So how do you deal with it? So I make a, a, a horizontal incision along the inferior border of the inferior turbinate. So you make that horizontal incision and then what you do is you do something like the septal correction itself. That is you elevate the, the mucosa but of course it's a little difficult because the surface is not smooth. It's slightly irregular. So you try to elevate that um, mucosa there. You see how I'm elevating the mucoperiosteum. See how you elevate it. It's a little difficult but then you have to do it because you cannot take that uh, a medial mucosa because all the nerve endings are there and it will lead to an empty nose syndrome. If you cut the inferior turbinate, the patient will land up in uh, empty nose syndrome. Never do that. So the trick here, the trick here is to go superiorly. See here, I'm going superiorly and to get the ascending process of the maxilla here. So that's the best way to get a cleavage. So many people try here and the mucosa tears. So the trick is to go up and to get that bone here. That's the ascending process of the maxilla. You will get that. And then what you do, you see here. Once you get that, you see that bone there. So once you get that, it will automatically get elevated. You see how the mucosa is getting elevated. So that's the trick. Never try to dislodge this bone. Many people actually, what they do is initially they fracture, out fracture it. Never out fracture the inferior turbinate. Then it becomes lax. And then you cannot elevate it. So you, like the tympanic annulus, you should have it intact. Then you can elevate the... Uh, membrane. It's the same. Now I'm elevating the mucosa from the lateral aspect of the bone. You see here, I'm elevating the mucosa from the lateral aspect of the bone 
And once you do that, you have that bone coming out completely. So you see that I'm taking off that bone completely. So you have mucosa here and mucosa there. Till the end, I've removed all that. And then once you fracture it, you see what happens is it becomes so shriveled. And there is absolutely no bleeding. In fact, you don't have to even pack. I keep a little surgery cell here along the anterior end of this inferior turbinate. And that's it. Believe me, this is the best way to get results in inferior turbinate uh, resection. This is what is called partial, that is 50% inferior turbinate resection. Of course, uh, I think that there's a modification by taking off the anterior head. I think that was actually proposed by, I do not know if I'm right, but it is, I think, by Professor Richard Harvey. Uh, the initial technique was proposed by Professor P.J. Ormore in his paper. But this resection of the anterior head, I think, was proposed by Professor Richard Harvey. Now here we are, now what we are trying to do is doing the same thing and then try to elevate this mucosa. So get out the anterior head, don't retain the anterior head. If you retain that, believe me, even if you do a fantastic septal correction and things like that, you will land up again with nasal obstruction. This is something which I want to tell you, if you do not do anything for the turbinate, this patient is going to land up with a, 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 a nasal obstruction. Uh, in due course. So you see here, I've resected that bone. The mucosa is preserved. So in uh, Professor original, um, this one technique of Professor P.J. Ormold, what he did was he resected the uh, uh, mucosa on the lateral aspect. But here what we have done is we have not resected because I don't want any injury to the nasal acrimal duct orifice. So that's why I just retained both these mucosas and you see how I've rolled it up. And you see the result of the turbinate. It's so small, but still we have preserved the nerve endings and he's not going to land up in an empty nose syndrome. So this is uh, uh, what I'm going to show you as my first video because this is the commonest uh, which you're going to face in practice that is inferior turbinate hypertrophy. What to do for it? The best is not to resect the inferior turbinate, but to do a 50% reduction by maintaining and preserving the medial mucosa of the inferior turbinate. Now, let us go. We will have questions if we want. Uh, Harsha, you can moderate. Yeah. If anybody has questions, you tell me. I'm ready to answer the questions now. And Dr. Ashish is asking. What okay. Do we have questions? What is your recommendation of uh, partial submucosal? Um, so, there are some other techniques. Of course, uh, I don't know what questions they are asking, but uh, you can moderate the whole session. There are so many methods. Number one is uh, there is a submucous diathermy. Some people put in a submucous diathermy, come out, or some people do what is called island corbulation. They use a little laser for as islands. There are so many techniques described, but believe me, I have tried all the techniques and none of it works on long term. It actually recurs. Uh, submucous diathermy being the worst. It comes back in six months, it will come back. So do not try to, or there is another called the micro tunneling. You do a micro tunneling of the uh, 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 the, the turbinate, uh, make a small tunnel and then go inside, debride it and come out. There's a debrider blade. You can do that also, but even that is not as effective as the 50% reduction where you remove the complete bone, retain the mucosa on both sides, nicely fracture it out. You will get a very shriveled but very beautiful uh, uh, looking neo turbinate. Okay, so uh, this is done under local anesthesia. You can do it under local anesthesia. And uh, uh, you can just spray and give blocks of the nose and that's it. You don't have to have general anesthesia for this. So you have any questions now? Can you, uh, if you want, you can uh, ask the questions. Harsha, Regarding you're not moderating the session. Sir, there are some questions. I can see only Professor A.P. Shah. Uh, I can only see him apart from him and Dr. Vivo1818 is there. Apart from them, I can't see anybody. Uh, there so uh, There are some lot of questions coming up, sir. Uh, yeah, so you're not getting questions, uh, Harpit? Mr. Harpit? Do you infiltrate uh, uh, before uh, uh, resection? Does what, man? Harsha? You infiltrate the turbinate. You have to unmute, man. Sir, can you hear me, sir? Yeah, speak a little Hello? loudly, Dr. Harsha. Yeah, yeah, sir, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you're talking, Dr. Harsha. Okay, Let, let's go on to the next uh, next video. I'm not getting questions from Harsha. Share. Okay, let us go on to the next video. The next video will be... Uh, 
let us see this uh, um we'll see antiquinal polyp okay let's see antiquinal polyp then we'll go to ethmoidal polyp we have uh, so many videos are you seeing this harsha you have to give me a feedback man yes sir uh, can you hear uh, your voice is not at all audible okay you see here now this is actually the antiquinal polyp uh, you know it's otherwise called the killian's polyp and uh, the the many people what i have seen is once they see the polyp they actually go inside and start debriding the polyp now to me i think we have some tricks to do it so you should learn the tricks the post graduates you should learn the tricks the first trick is you take off the fluid from inside the polyp how do you do that use uh, ribbon gauze that is i use gauze piece you have seen me using gauze piece one in 1000 adrenaline concentration of one in 1000 adrenaline and you nicely press the polyp and you have to use mechanical and chemical action of adrenaline to completely compress this polyp so this is the first step in antiquinal polyp surgery so don't when you see the polyp just don't go inside and start debriding it don't do that because you need all this for histology so what i'm going to do now is i'm going to play this video you see here i'm now trying to compress see what i'm trying to do i'm trying to compress this once i compress it what happens with a uh, gauze piece what in you see how much shriveled it has become and then i want all of this for biopsy please understand it might be a uh, inverted papilloma so the i mean of course uh, not i don't say in all but at least 1 to 5% of cases you can have an inverted papilloma and so what i do is i chop off this and then either i deliver it through the um, oral cavity or i deliver it through the nose so this is what i do depending upon the scan you can know with the ct scan so the second step which i do is identify so once i have taken off the nasal and quinal part so there are two parts which i have already removed now what is remaining only the anteral part is remaining so what i will do now is i will first identify the natural ostium and for that what i will do i am just taking a little bit of the upper part of the uncinate process a little bit of it you can see the bulla now and i can see the natural ostium here so i do the same submucous dissection you can see the submucous dissection and that's the natural ostium you can see here the natural ostium and you connect the natural ostium with the axillary ostium always and then once you do that use a 45 degree telescope and the best instrument to use is the hue visor is the best is the hue visor so you have malleable hue visor as well but i don't like to use the uh, uh, debrad sometimes i use the rat 60 but if i am able to do it uh, the best would be hue visor many of them ask me what is the cost for recurrence of antiquinal polyp please understand that if there is a recurrence in antiquinal polyp it's purely because you have left behind the site of attachment of the antiquinal polyp there is no doubt that if you remove a little bit of the sleeve of the mucosa around the site of attachment it will not recur there is no chance for it to recur this this statement not i have not made but professor stamberger uh, uh, has made this so uh, the, the that's the best prognostic uh, uh, you know um, the the surgery which you can do in a uh, nasal surgery so uh, what i have done in this case is actually what i have done is i have uh, seen the uh, um, site of attachment of the antiquinal polyp and i have removed that antiquinal polyp let us see this case of antiquinal polyp again okay here we are no, i think that's the same same are you uh, seeing this somebody has to give me a feedback my dear harsha yes, yes sir yes sir it is playing sir harsha sir it is playing sir okay oh now i can hear you harsha okay now you can see that this is the antiquinal polyp here so what is the first step dr harsha can you tell me what is the first step you have to mechanically and chemically compress this polyp and remove the fluid from the polyp so that is the first step compress it compress it by mechanical and chemical pressure you see how this polyp is going posteriorly you see that that's a polyp and of course this is classic i just want to demonstrate that this is an antiquinal polyp and the surgery would definitely be a uh, um, a complete surgery for this polyp okay right now let us go on to yeah there's a question uh, how do you yeah. uh, 
uh, what is the role of canine fossa trepanation if the site of attachment is not seen? Okay, right. Very, very good. Uh, very good question. I have all the scenarios there, but I'm, I'm not able to collect it uh, in one day. Uh, what I'm going to tell you is you should know four different techniques in anthropoidal polyp. Four different techniques to tackle anthropoidal polyp. The site of attachment can be either on the posterior wall, the roof, or the anterior wall, or at the junction of the anterior and the medial wall, or the medial wall. So, if, if it is going to be the superior wall, like what you saw here, this is the simplest scenario. Or if it is going to be in the posterior wall, these two are the simplest scenarios. But preoperatively, we cannot judge where it is arising from. Point number one. Point number two, how will you judge where this polyp is arising from? Once you see, uh, you have taken off the nasal and the quinal part, what you have to do is you put in a lot of roller gauze. Try to put in a lot of roller gauze soaked in adrenaline and then try to squeeze that portion of the polyp. So if you f uh, find the polyp like this, it's so easy. But sometimes you'll have the polyp filling the hole of the antrum. Then you put in a lot of roller gauze and then when you remove that, you will definitely see the site of attachment. So it can be either you can actually see it in a one side or you can have multiple sites of attachment. So the posterior wall and the roof are the easiest to tackle. But if it is going to be the anterior lateral wall, the uh, uh, junction of the anterior and the medial wall, these are the things which you should do. Number one, you can go in for an inferior meatal and trotamine. So you can go through uh, the inferior meatus and use a RAT60 debrider blade with a 70 degree telescope from above. You can actually drill that completely. So you can, I mean, sorry, remove that completely. So this is step number one. Step number two is if this doesn't work, if, if it is actually still more anterior, the next is a canine fossa trifine. So how do you do a canine fossa trifine? What you have to do, I, I, um, I didn't collect the videos of that. Maybe uh, I will show it in some, uh, some of my class. You draw a line from the mid pupillary line down like this and you draw a line from the inferior, uh, um, um, that's a horizontal line from here, the uh, ala from here like this. So these two lines, they join at a point and that's exactly the point you have to lift the lip and just make a small, uh, that is already a metronic uh, set for that. But if you don't have that, take a mountain gouge and just tap it. So once you tap it, put in the debrider inside, put in the debrider without a sheet, without a sheet, put in the debrider, put a 70 degree telescope and then you can take it out. But even this, sometimes it's difficult. If it is going to be in the alveolar recess, then what you do is you have to do a pre-lacrimal approach. So a pre-lacrimal approach is the final court of appeal for anthropoidal polyps. I hope I answered your question. Okay. Any other question or shall we go? Sir, he, uh, there's one question. What is your advice for division AC polyps? Revision AC polyp. See, the reason why uh, AC polyp comes back is because the previous surgeon has not taken the site of attachment. Please understand. So if the, if, so if the site of attachment is a pedicle, if it is a pedicle, it is easy. Okay. There are some anthropoidal polyps which have, I don't know, there is a study which says how many sites of attachments are there. I have not referred to that, but there are in our hundreds and hundreds of cases we have seen some polyps, they have a lot of sites that are diffusely, totally getting originated from the anterolateral wall, from the floor, from the medial wall, everywhere. Then what we do is in those instances, we nasalize the sinus. So what is, what is nasalization of the sinus? We remove the mucosa completely. We remove the mucosa. If there is a diffuse, complete attachment in all the walls, then we nasalize the sinus means you remove the, it's something like the cardiola but you do it endoscopically. We just debride away all that mucosa out. So that's, that's for the revision. If you find a site of attachment, then try to, some people nowadays use coblation also. They use the coblation, they bend it, and they actually uh, make a nice circle of the uh, mucosa all around, and they elevate it and remove it. So that's also possible, right? So anybody else? And uh, uh, there are a lot of questions about pre-lacrimal approach, sir. Pre-lacrimal approach, uh, we will see. I, I am not sure if uh, we have collected that video. Uh, in fact, uh, 
I, I will show you a prelacrimal approach, not, don't, not, not to worry. So prelacrimal approach is a very simple approach. There's nothing big about it. Simple and I will show that to you, definitely. Okay. No, there's one more question. Do you cauterize the site of attachment? No, we don't cauterize the site of attachment. Uh, it is not like a sort of rhinos produce or something like that. This is, you, what you have to do is you have to go sub periosteally and dissect that whole uh, mucosa along with a uh, uh, area of normal mucosa. That's it. Don't try to cauterize and all that. You don't have to. But uh, nowadays, I, I'm, as I told you, the people use cobblation. Cobblation on that and uh, that's good enough. It doesn't cause much crusting. Yeah. And uh, what are the landmarks for the inferior meatal androstomy? Ah, landmarks is a very, very nice question actually. So let us actually show that uh, screen share now. Uh, let us screen share. Share. Are you able to see the screen now? Yes, sir. Okay. Let us let us go in and show you the turbinate video. So in that you can see the. Uh... Okay. Here we are. Now I'm going to show you exactly the site of the inferior meatal and product. We are not able to see the video. We're not able to see the video. I have started sharing, boss. No, I think it must have gone to the other screen, sir. Yeah, to bring it back. What? Oh. What happened? No, we are not. We are just getting the view of the folder, sir. Folder. Are you seeing my uh, this one or not? My uh, screen or not? I can see your screen, sir. Only the folder screen. Ah, oh, you can see now. I'm going to I'm going to put that turbinate video, and I will show you where to do the inferior meatal antrotomy. Can you see that I'm using a VLC now? Can yes, you see? Yes, 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 visible, sir. Yes. Now you see here. I'm just going to show you exactly the position of the inferior meatal antrotomy. That's what I'm going to show you now. See here. Now this is the anterior attachment of the inferior turbinate, which is exactly here. This is the uh, vertical attachment, that's the anterior attachment of the inferior turbinate. The nasolacrimal duct is exactly 9 millimeters posterior to it. It's no, 9 millimeters. No, sir, we cannot. Sir, the, sir, the video is not uh, visible yet. Uh, what? No, sir, we are not able to see the VLC player, sir. We are able to see your screen, but not the VLC player. You have to mini minimize it, sir. Uh, now, Click on the share screen and choose that VLC window. Now, now, no, sir, not, not yet. Stop share and go again. Now, my dear friend. Yes, sir. Yes. Yes. Okay. See here. Now, I'm just going to show you that this is the anterior end of the inferior turbinate. Okay. This is the anterior. Can you see the screen here? Anterior end of the inferior turbinate. Yes, sir. We can see. Okay. Now you see here. I'm just going to resect this anterior end. I'm going to debride the anterior end. And you see, if I if I show you, you can see this. This is the bone of the anterior end of the inferior turbinate. See here. That's the bone. Can you see the bone of the anterior end? Or the inferior turbinate. Yes. So the nasolacrimal duct lies on the superior aspect, nine millimeters posterior to it. So that means your side of the inferior meatal antrotomy, antrotomy should be one centimeter posterior to the anterior end of the inferior turbinate, and it should not be high. It should be slightly in the middle of the inferior meatus. It should not go high. It should be in the middle. It should be one centimeter posterior, or even slightly posterior. But if you go too posterior, then See, the anterior part of this inferior meatus, the bone will be thick. You can't enter. So at one point, you, we, when you use the uh, upturned blackest lead, it will slide inside. It will just go inside. That is the best side. And that is actually in the uh, one centimeter posterior to the anterior end of the inferior turbinate. Okay, that is the side for the inferior meatal antrotomy. Any doubts you have? So this will be exactly the place where you enter. Okay? Right. So, any other questions? You can go to the next uh, surgery. Okay, we'll go to the next question. Uh, we'll go to the next. We'll see um, uh, ethmoidal polyposis. Okay, let us see ethmoidal polyposis. 
or where is wine? So, this is a presentation. Stop. Presentation, stop share also? Yeah. I mean, very little, I can. Now, can you see my screen, uh, Harsha? Yeah, we can see the VLC only, sir. No, stop Now, my dear friend. Yes, sir. Okay. Now you're going to see a uh, a video here of a earth model polyp. Okay. Let us see this video. Of course, uh, these are all videos which I recorded uh, in my initial days of my career. So uh, some people might have seen this video, but it's okay. I'm just trying to teach uh, juniors, that's very important. So a patient had a concha bullosa, you can see here, that's a concha bullosa. And whenever you're trying to do a concha plasty, never put your knife from above downwards. It should always be from below upwards. Because when you put it from above downwards, you will destabilize the middle turbinate. You will destabilize the middle turbinate. So here, what I'm trying to do is to resect the lateral lamella of the uh, middle turbinate. I'm trying to resect it. Of course, I can use a through biting, I can use a scissors, uh, the best instrument will be a through biting and also a debrider. So you see, I'm using a debrider with a through biting and I'm trying to debride. You can see that I've debrided the uh, um, lateral lamella of the middle turbinate. You see here, very important. So when you do the conchoplasty, it is important that you take off that lamella completely there. And once you take it off, then you have all that polyp. You can see that polyp. And we have resected that middle top a concha, concha bullosa. And you can now see that I'm now trying to define anatomy. So try to define your anatomy. Once you try to define your, what are the anatomical landmarks you have to define? Number one is you have to define the uncinate process. So you have to try to define the uncinate process. See, that's the uncinate process. This is actually a medialized uncinate. You see here how nicely you can see the leaf-like medialized uncinate process. I'm trying to debride that. This is the axilla of the middle meatus. You can see that that's the axilla of the middle meatus. See how nicely you can see that. And always, this is very important, please, my dear friends. Very important trick. See here, when you resect the concha bullosa, please do not resect the upper 10 millimeter, 5 millimeters of the lateral lamella. This is a very, very important point. Many people, what they do is they completely resect it. No, don't do it. Leave behind five millimeters. Why? Because when you're doing the frontal here, sometimes you tend to think if you if you don't have this piece of bone, you will tend to think that this could that could be a polyp here, which can actually mimic a frontal, and you might enter like this inside. And that's one reason I've seen three cases like that: concha bullosa resection and polyp resection, and then somebody has gone right inside like this into the skull base. So always. Retain the upper five millimeters of the lateral lamella till the end. So this is very important till the end of your surgery. So this is something which is a very important point I want to tell uh, for concha bullosa. And then you see here how I'm doing the uncinate. See, this is a medialized uncinate. The best way to do a medialized uncinate surgery is by using a sickle knife. So best way is to use a sickle knife for the U-turn. So what happens is the uncinate goes like that and turns like this behind. So for that um, uh, uncinate which turns behind, the best is a sickle knife with a through biting. So always try to use that. And then it becomes a normal uncinate now. Now you see that that's the, uh, uh, that, that's the uncinate which has gone uh, and it's, yeah. Now you see that, I've removed that. Now you can use a uh, back biting. You see that, that is a normal uncinate. So uh, you, uh, you can see here that once I've removed that, you can see the natural ostium here. This is a natural ostium. And of course, in a case of a polyp, you always want to do a type 2 or a type 3 um, ostium, middle meatal antrostomy. And here we are doing a type 2 osteotomy, middle meatal antrostomy. You have type 1, type 2, and type 3. So type 3 is done more for, you know, fungus or inverted papilloma. Um, so you can see here, I'm doing the type 2 and I'm giving a good wash. Always try to wash, wash, wash because you might have polyps coming out like this. You have to wash every sinus with warm saline. 
I use uh, saline at 40 degrees even when doing fast. That gives you good hemostasis. This patient was a hypertensive. So uh, this kind of polyp, would you completely take off all this polyp? So I generally, so there is a classification by PJ Ormore. And he says there is type 1, type 2 and type 3 polyps. And in type 3, you have to completely debride away all these polyps. But here, I, I couldn't find that this is uh, something like a type. I thought it was a type 2 and I just left it. And I'm following up this patient with steroids uh, washes. Of course, the patient is doing fine. So as soon as you do a middle, so the first step in polyp surgery, be it a revision, be it a normal polyp, the first step is nicely widen the middle medial antrostomy. So here, you widen the middle medial antrostomy. See here. And when you widen the middle medial antrostomy, the step number two, step number two is to identify the upper margin of the maxillary sinus. That is what is called the ethmo maxillary crest. So here we are. This is the ethmo maxillary crest. You see here. Now this is the maxilla. This is the ethmo maxillary crest. That is the junction of the ethmoid with the maxilla. And then keep your debrider parallel to the ethmo maxillary crest and go upwards like this. See here. You have to go upwards. See how my debrider is moving. You can see here, I'm now trying to debride exactly parallel to the lamina papyracea. See here, I'm doing parallel to the lamina papyracea. And in multiple polyps, and if it's going to be a very uh, uh, a revision case or something like that, I generally get the lamina papyracea and I follow the lamina like the, uh, you know, in a mastoid, we follow the dural plate. The same thing I do, I just follow the lamina, but staying close uh, uh, to the uh, basal lamella. Don't go towards the skull base. You have to follow. That's the basal lamella now. And I'm now trying to go parallel to the lamina papyracea. Just stay parallel to the lamina papyracea. You see the god of the debrider blade. Always look at the god of the debrider blade. I'm just trying to take off that spicule. Immediately I will tilt it away from the lamina papyracea. See, see that. That's just taking off very gently but not entering into the lamina papyracea. This is very important. And then I'm just trying to Generally, we don't use blackasli, and you can see how the basal lamella has been defined. For the basal lamella, to me, I think the best technique is the gauze piece technique. See here, I'm using a gauze piece, and then gently putting it in the antro inferior aspect. And I'm using this uh, was taught to me by Professor Nikhil Butt, and that's a fantastic technique. And what I do with the gauze piece is I just move the blackasli and the gauze up and down. So once I do that. It's a very atraumatic way. You will never enter into the skull base. For the beginners, please, please follow this technique. It's a brilliant technique. And actually, you will not, uh, if you are a very experienced surgeon, then you can use the debrider wherever you want. But if you are a beginner, try to use the gauze piece technique for the posterior ethmoid because you will not injure the skull base in the posterior ethmoid. So use the gauze piece, go inside and just move that gauze piece up and down. You see now, now all the spicules are beautifully uh, coming out and I just have to debride it. You see that I'm debriding it. You can see that I'm trying to completely debride this. And once I debride it, and you can see here, and very important, see, I always call the skull base movement of the debride is called the beggar's movement. I, call, I should not tell that, but actually, you know what the beggar does? He tries to hold his hand like this and do the same like this, like this. So that's exactly how your debrider should move. It should move like this. It should move like this. You see like this. It's like a baby holding the baby. You can call it the holding the baby. See that? I'm going to show you that movement of the debrider. You see here? I'm going to show you the movement of the debrider on the skull. See that? See that movement of the skull debrider. Very gentle movements, but I'm just hugging that skull base. And when I'm going on the lamina papyracea, I'm just trying to gently shave that and I'm uh, over the lamina papyracea. The movement of the debrider is very, very important, my dear friends. Uh, uh, that is that makes the real surgery, uh, real surgeon. You now, what I do is I see the debrider blade now. Now, once I've dealt with the posterior ethmoid, I move the debrider like a swing. It's called jula. Jula in Hindi is called the swing. You move that like a jula from the middle turbinate till the level of the lamina papyracea. One, two, three, four. So what you will do is you will identify. So that's what is called the Jula movement. And this is actually the uh, skull base movement. All these movements uh, are different. So I usually demonstrate that uh, I, during live surgery. Of course, it's a recorded video. So trying to post it as much without editing. 
not much of editing. You can see how the debrad is going and trying to gently take that away. And then here is the Jula movement. This is called the Jula movement. And then you can see the posterior model neurovascular bundle there. And after that, you identify the superior meatal window. You see here, that's the Jula movement here. That's the Jula movement. And then you go and identify the superior meatal window. See how nice, that's a superior turbinate. You can see the end on view of the superior turbinate. And don't resect the whole of the superior turbinate. Leave behind the upper two thirds and just resect the lower one third of the superior turbinate. That's a superior turbinate. And you see how the movement. Never have your debrider towards the septum. See here. See where my god is. My god is always towards the septum. And the debrider is away from the septum. Because if you raw the surface of the septum, it will start bleeding. And you might have an osteal stenosis of the sphenoid sinus. This is very, very important. So many people hold it towards the septum and debride the septum, which is actually wrong. To me, I think that will actually lead to an osteal snow. That's an onodi cell. You can see the optic now. You Once you see a cell like this, immediately you recognize the optic now. And then here, we have opened up the sphenoid. You can see beautifully the Parsons ridge. This is the Parsons ridge, which separates the sphenoid from the onodi cell. Always, always, when you have like this, you have to connect the sphenoid with the onodi cell. You have to connect both these things. Of course, this is the view inside the sphenoid sinus. You can see that's the uh, sphenoid sinus, that's the onodi cell. What I will do now, you see here how I open up the uh, 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 Parsons ridge. See, see that movement. This is actually moving upwards and laterally. Up, but this movement, never do it when the optic canal is dehiscent. If the optic canal is dehiscent, don't make this movement. You see here, that's the Parsons ridge, the remnant of the Parsons ridge. And you have to remove the Parsons ridge. Why? Because you have to identify the skull base. This is the skull base, the planum. So once you identify the planum, you see what I'm trying to do. Is I'm going to show you the whole of the skull base. That's all the skull base. And draped with mucosa. You see, the whole area is draped. I have not have a single, I don't have a single area where there is raw bone. Or you should not have stalactites. You should not have bony projections from above. I, this is a wrong, wrong technique. So you should have a smooth cavity. You see, that's a paraclival carotid. That's the cella. Of course, in the future classes, I'm going to, yeah, that's actually the median uh, canal. You can see the median canal here. Very nicely seen, median canal. Paraclival carotid. Lateral recess here. That is the V2. That's a V2. And you can see here that I'm putting now. Now is where I will use a 70 degree telescope. This is where I use the 70. Now is where I always say, you have retained this. See here. Now, now is where it's very important. Now you have retained this part of the middle turbinate. That is the lateral lamella. Five millimeters of the lateral lamella you left behind. So you know that the frontal is lateral to it. So that is why I always say, retain that five millimeters of the lateral lamella. And you see what I'm trying to do is take off. That's the uncinate process. And I come for the bulla down technique here. This is the bulla down technique. So don't go for the bulla up if there is a distorted anatomy. If you are a beginner, the best thing is the bulla down. It's always better to identify the skull base and then come anteriorly and hug the nasofrontal beak and then go inside. You will always find the frontal there. You can see now, this again is what is called the Gauss piece technique. You see here, I'm introducing the Gauss piece. These are all very atraumatic techniques. Please understand, I'm not teaching a very tough technique to you. Very, very atraumatic technique. You can see that I've introduced a Gauss piece inside the frontal. And then once I remove that Gauss piece, automatically the frontal will open. You see now, I'm using an upturned black. See that? It opened up the frontal. Very beautiful. Now, how did I do that? You can ask me, where did you put that Gauss piece? The Gauss piece is introduced close to the nasofrontal beak. This is the nasofrontal beak. Palpate with the J curate, the nasofrontal beak. And then put in a Gauss piece like the tonsil, just gently. Don't, don't apply pressure. Gently at the behind of the Gauss piece, you can just slide it up. It will automatically go only inside the frontal. So once you identify the nasofrontal beak, there's, there's nothing, no problem to identify the frontal. And then use a RAD60 and widen it till the level of the anterior ethmoidal artery. You will have a small cell between the frontal and the anterior ethmoidal artery. You see here, some people use a reverse uh, forceps here. You see here, this is very important. This is the anterior ethmoidal artery. This is the anterior ethmoidal artery going obliquely from posterior to anterior. You see here, very important. See, this, this is the area which you saw. That's the frontal. But there's another area which is here. This is the anterior fovea. 
always try. So many people leave behind a shell of bone here, leave behind a cell here. Commonest area of leaving behind a cell is this area. So you should always try to remove that shell of bone, connect that frontal till the level of the anterior ethmoid artery. So what are the boundaries of the frontal recess? What are the boundaries of the frontal recess if you look at it? So medially by the middle turbinate here, that's a small lateral lamella of the concha bullosa, laterally by the lamina papyracea, posteriorly by the anterior ethmoid artery, and anteriorly by the nasofrontal peak. So that is the boundary of the frontal recess. You see here, anterior ethmoid artery, anterior fovea, frontal, la lamina papyracea, middle turbinate, and nasofrontal peak. So this should be the dimension. It's around 1.2 to 1.5 centimeter. This area is around 1.5 centimeter. So don't be uh, uh, having any doubt here. So that's the skull base you can see here. This, this is the planum. This is the posterior fovea, anterior model artery, anterior fovea, and the frontal. You see now, this, this should be the look of the cavity. This always, always, you should have a type 2 antrostomy. You should have a direct look into the sphenoid sinus when you look at it because post-operatively when you douche it with the, uh, uh, the butisonide washes, it, it is so easy to reach that the, the steroid solution will reach the sinuses. So you see here, this is the, 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 the view of the cavity, final view of the cavity. No stalactites, no stalagmites, mucosa all around, no raw bone. Very, very important, no raw bone everywhere because that will lead to osteitis. Okay, so with this, I'm stopping the screen share. So, are you able to see me, Harsha? Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, we are at uh, 7.30 now. We, if we have questions, we will take the questions. And then we will show some good videos again after this. Question from Dr. Ashish. Yeah. Did what saline wash caused disturbance in mucociliary mechanism post-operatively? Okay, this is a commonly asked question. I am not telling hot saline. Please understand, it's warm saline. Okay, warm saline at 40 degrees has not shown to uh, affect the mucociliary action. I can show you any number of papers and we use that almost in every case. Every case of skull base, we do that. And we have never seen any problem with using and also there are so many papers which say that we can use warm saline. But what is the advantage of warm saline? The advantage is you will get very good hemostasis. So you will have excellent uh, um, the feel. You will not have bleeding at all during fest. So the best hemostat to me is warm saline. This is the, this is the answer. Any other question? Uh, what is the benefit of irrigation side on the shaver blade in fest? What is the benefit of irrigation? Yeah. Uh, uh, irrigation. Uh, I don't know, sir. That is the question. What is the benefit? What irrigation? What irrigation? I don't understand because usually we have an irrigation. For the um, for the blade, not to for, for it not to get blocked. So here you can see that it has got an irrigation channel. So you have an irrigation going like this. This is a suction suction channel is through this, and this is the irrigation channel. Irrigation just not to get it make it blocked. That's that's why we are using that is there. So I think um, do we have any questions or shall we go ahead? Uh, one one question. Ah, uh, Doctor Prakash what Gupta is there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, sir, there is one question. What yeah. do you do if attachment of polyp is on anterior lateral bowl of maxillary sinus? If there is a polyp attached to the anterior anterolateral wall or the inferior wall, if there are type 3 polyps, I am telling you, there are type 3 polyps, then it is best to use a RAD 120 deep rider blade and deep ride all that polyp. If you are not able to, then next, don't struggle with it. Go for the um, uh, uh, the antral, uh, anterior uh, wall and just make a small antral puncture here and just put in a debrider blade and debride completely. So the best is going through the antral anterior wall of the maxillary sinus. So that's an antral puncture. Yeah, so anything else? Some questions uh, related to maxillary antrostomy. Most of them are asking you to explain the types of uh, antrostomy. Yeah, type, I, I'm going to show you also. Uh, let us go, where is the, uh, are you sharing the screen now? No, sir, we are not here. Okay, now. Uh, there are questions about uh, anterior ethmoidal artery, sir. Ma, okay. Uh, hey, Bula. 
How do I now get that Sir, step? In the market, you know, presentation. Where is my presentation? Share. Share. Desktop. Share. Okay. One. Okay, I will show you one anterior model artery uh, bleeding. Uh, you want to see that? Okay, many people ask me, are you, are you seeing the uh, yeah, screen yes, now? Yes, sir, we are seeing this. Okay, you see here, what, this is my case, okay? I did this, okay? Uh, this is the case of AFRS, uh, um, fungal rhinosinusitis. You can see the, this is the polyp. Can you see the polyp here? And now, allergic fungal rhinosinusitis. I'm now trying to debride. You see, it's the movement of the debrider. And you see the distance of the, all steps yeah. of the surgery are not being shown. You can see the skull base on the right side. And this is the right side. You can see that. I'm going to show you the right side. See here. The anterior model, if you have a pneumatization like this, this is supraorbital pneumatization, then the anterior model artery is dehiscent. And sometimes you can have fungus over it. You can have fungus right over it. Actually, see the pneumatization. See how going far above the orbit. This is called the supraorbital pneumatization. So now you see here, that's the anterior model artery right in the center here. You can see here. And the fungus is going above. You can see here, right there. And I'm going behind the anterior model artery. Now you can see here the supraorbital cell. And you see how I am now taking that fungus. See the anterior model artery here. Can you see the anterior model artery? Yes. This is how an anterior model artery appears naked. The, we call that the uh, lying on the mesentery. You see how the anterior model artery is completely. Skeletonized, completely skeletonized. You can see that very clearly that this is the anterior model artery going from posterior to anterior. Now, in the uh, one of my patients, when I was doing it, you can see here what happened was the there was a supraorbital cell, but I was doing it very fast and see what I did. This is my case. Okay, that's fungus. I'm going anterior. You see that? See what happened? That is the anterior model artery. Did you see that? Yes, sir. So the deep rider went and it was a supraorbital cell. See exactly when it goes. For, 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 there are, see, these are the conditions where, see that, see that. Now, if the artery is going to bleed inside the nose, then you're safe, okay? But if it retracts, the retraction comes only when you pull it to the black sleeve. When you pull it to the black sleeve, it will go inside the orbit and produce intraorbital uh, hematoma, a hemorrhage. Immediately what I did in this case was, I, I didn't panic at all because this is bleeding inside the nose. You just have to pack it and either you cauterize it with bipolar, don't use unipolar, you cauterize it with bipolar. Sometimes packing itself, it stops, but it's better to bipolarize this. But more importantly, always don't cover the eye. This has been told in many, many conferences. I don't have to insist that you have to cover the eye. You should, you should not cover the eye. And you should look for tonicity of the eye, whether the eye becomes swollen. Of course, we have had three cases uh, where we have had the eye swelling up. And we did what is called a medial orbitotomy right on that. But these are all very advanced cases of uh, uh, you know some tumors of the orbit and things like that. But you can see here that I'm, what I'm trying to do is to see the tonicity of the eye. And what I'm using is a bipolar. Don't use a unipolar, okay? Don't use a unipolar. Take a bipolar and you have to irrigate. And you see that? That's it. Finish. So don't panic. The same thing if it happens uh, after you uh, shift the patient from the, uh, to the ward, then you do what is called the lateral uh, um, cantholysis, uh, inferior cantholysis or the lateral cantholysis.